Welcome to Cut to the Chase, where we talk about compelling legal, regulatory, and public interest information and news. Your host is Greg Goldfarb, an attorney, entrepreneur, investor, and activist. All right, folks, it's time for our favorite podcast, Cut to the Chase. We're going to cut to the chase, and we're going to introduce one of the most interesting gentlemen I know of, uh, Dennis Scholl. How are you doing today? I'm well, Greg. It's good to be here. I finally got a chance to meet you uh, this weekend at the Locust Gallery at their little gala. So it's a good very party. Exciting. Very exciting. It was with my girlfriend, Stephanie Jaffe, who knows you. And I said, oh, my God. And she's like, oh, let's just, I'll just go up and introduce you. And I'm like, wow, that's crazy. So I did. And here we are. Uh, but I want to turn the clock back to like 1984 because I'm homegrown. Dennis was born in New Jersey, got over to South Florida, sunny South Florida, when you were eight years old. And in 1984, I am 18 years old, graduating from Miami Palmetto High School. Uh, Miami was not what Miami is today. I mean, people think, wow, Miami's so cool. It's so cultural. There's so much art. It's so exciting and with the food and all that. It was not like this back in 1984. And there were a few people, really, that made it what it is today. And Dennis is one of those people, the kingpin of the Miami art scene. But Dennis is not just art guy, gallery guy, going around buying art, and, you know, doing all that kind of stuff, forming some group or whatever. He has his background is amazing. And I know he doesn't want me to give a good a long one. So I'm going to go run through this. As yeah, let's move on as quickly as possible. But he started accounting lawyer, philanthropist, starting up all these companies, startups, 50 years old. He decides I'm going to make films. Like, Who is after 50 years old? People are like running out of steam. They're like, what am I going to do next? I don't know what to do. This man actually started and did several brilliant docu documentaries, a lot of them about Miami, a lot about the Miami art scene, a lot about the Miami scene before 1984. I'm not going to go through all the names. I'm going to put the links to all this stuff, but some of it's on Netflix. Some of actually, I've actually seen the Miami Sound, Sound Machine that was an amazing story. I didn't even know it was yours. So, all right, last year you were involved in Oolite Arts and they had gotten a humongous grant when the Art Center sold its building. 1984, the Art Center had just started. I didn't even know what was going on. Lincoln Road was dead. You know, I never went there. I went to see my grandfather growing up in Miami Beach you know, across the street was the convention center. The only thing cultural I did in Miami Beach was go to professional wrestling, okay? And here we are, thanks to people like Dennis. So Dennis, you you quote unquote retired, you you know, retired uh, last year from running Oolite, and, which has done amazing work. And I know they're gonna open up their, their, their brand new place in uh, 2025. And, but you didn't really retire. You, you're now, instead of focusing on everybody else, you're now focusing on your art. So that's the one thing that when I'm looking through the whole, I'm like, oh my God, this guy's done everything. The only thing he hasn't done is, is make art. And now here we are. So let's, yeah. let's yeah, we've gone from 1984. We're now on 2023. How has it been going in your latest endeavor? Well, first of all, let me give you a great, uh, a great little factoid. I went to Miami Norland High School which was in the north end of the county, Norland Vikings, go Vikings. And uh, I grew up in Miami Gardens. And what do Miami Norland and Miami Palmetto have in common? They were built from the same identical set of plans. So if you went up to Norland, you could find your home room. Nice. So, just a crazy thing. I, I graduated a little bit before you. I graduated in 73. And uh uh, and yeah, I've just had a, you know, this town has been great to me. It has always treated me well. It has allowed me to, you know, make my way through with, with a career or two or three. And um, it's, it's been a really wonderful place. I had lots of ch chances to leave and go elsewhere and do other things, but I'm kind of a 305 guy through and through. I love it here. I've always loved it here. And um, I'm kind of like, uh, like Udonis, 305 till I die. So uh, I love it. I love it. All right, you actually pointed out the article in the New York Times, How to Begin a Creative Life, uh, where they interviewed 150 artists on finding and shifting one's creative practice, which is, I guess, where you were at last year. And let's go through that. What were their challenges? Was there successes and failures? Or are you just off and running? Well, 
so up until the age of, I guess, 53, um, which is about 15 years ago, I didn't have a creative practice. I was the guy that tried to help everybody else as, as artists. And I, Deborah, my wife and I, we've been, you know, arts philanthropists for, for many, many decades, and we love doing it. But I never had a creative practice. And I didn't have a creative practice, I think, because I was afraid. Uh, it's, you know, I didn't want to, uh, the phrase I always use is, man, I don't want to make uh, films or art or anything like that, because what if it sucks, yeah. you know, and you kind of get in your own head and you kind of get in your own way. And then I woke up at the age of 53 and I, 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 I remember exactly the day it happened. I, I was watching Obama be inaugurated the first time and Aretha Franklin got up to sing and she had on a crazy hat. And I thought to myself, why is she wearing that crazy hat? And, you know, you see these church ladies wearing these hats all the time. What is that about? And he said, you know what? I got to make a film about that. And, and I, it just came from nowhere. I had been doing a little on-camera stuff for a local resort television network, both here and in Aspen, Colorado, where I've spent a lot of time. And, uh, but I didn't really like it. I, you know, I have a face made for radio and I, you know, it just wasn't that fun. Um, but the off-camera stuff, the producing, the directing, I said, wow, that's kind of interesting. So four weeks later, at this time, I'm working for the Knight Foundation, where I'm doing their national arts program. And we, we, were, we had invited a lot of people from the Black churches in Miami to come to uh, the, the Arch to see Free Gospel Sunday. So I'm standing out in front. I'm greeting people. We would send buses to the churches, bring people in, box lunch. Beautiful, beautiful event. And off the bus are these beautiful ladies wearing these incredible hats again. So that was like, that was it. I was like the thing. I said, you know what? I am going to do this. And I took one of the guys that I had been working with for the on-camera stuff. He was a producer and a shooter. His name is Marlon Johnson. And I said, you know, I want to make a movie, but I don't really know how. I said, I, I said, I want to make a movie about why African-American women wear hats to church. He says, dude, he said, I grew up in those churches. So I was like, great. So I made this five minute film, he and I, and another guy named Chad Tangle, both awesome filmmakers. You know, I had this idea. I knew what I wanted. They were willing to roll with me. And um, eventually the film played 30 film festivals, including some of the biggest short wow. festivals in the world. We won, a, we won a regional Emmy for it. And I thought, wow, that was really fun. Let's do it again. And so it's now 15 years. I've made 80 shorts uh, and seven feature films, some of which you talked about, The Last Resort, about the, the elderly folks on South Beach in the 70s. I've got a new film out uh, called Naked Ambition. We'll talk about, I hope, uh, about Bunny Yeager, the famous pinup model uh, who became the world's most famous pinup photographer. Um, I've made a lot of films since then. And so I really got a lot of joy out of it. But then probably about, I don't know, maybe maybe eight, nine, 10 years ago, it, it, it was difficult for me to be the kind of obsessive person that I am when I'm doing a startup, you know, but with the films, you take it to a certain point and then you have to bring in an editor and you have to bring in a graphics guy and you have to bring in a shooter. And so you can't do it like 24 seven, like I like to do things. So I began very quietly because I, I was afraid it wouldn't be good. I began an art practice, a studio art practice, and I began to make work and I make work using historical objects uh, and I assemble them into a work of art. Uh, I've made I've made films, uh, films. I've made artwork using um, uh, vintage newspapers. I've made uh, artworks using the Beatles royalty statements, John Lennon and Paul McCartney's actual royalty statements that they would go into their accountant's office and look at. Somehow I was able to find those online and buy them. And I, so I've got this art practice and it it's kind of rolling a little. I mean, I, I, I've done shows so far in New York, in London, in Berlin, uh, in uh, Croatia, in Serbia. I've got shows coming up in, uh, in Uruguay. Uh, and uh, and Scotland, it's been great. It's been super yeah. fun. Well, that'll keep you very busy. You know, Art Basel wasn't even around 1984, and also that kind of put Miami on on the map on the map and made it a cultural place. Um, you know, one of the things I think that you know you're you're sort of a I know you don't want to hear this, but you're 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 a role model and you are inspirational. And there are certain things that happen when you're growing up, seeds that get planted that I don't know if really they they should have been planted. But one of them was like the right, you know, your right brain, your left brain. So like, all right, you're, you're good in math. So you're like automatically conditioned to think that all you're going to do in life is math, accounting, finances and whatever. But you started out as an accountant and now here you are all these years 
you know, creating, coming up with ideas, making stuff. And so I think you are a testament to the fact that that, that paradigm might not be the best thing for, for parents to throw around, for teachers to throw around. You know, law school definitely beats out a lot of creativity out of you. I mean, it really just hammers you. You're afraid to write a sentence that isn't factually correct, you know, because the court is not going to be pleased. And so for me, it really did take it out of me for a very long time. And um, I, I hadn't practiced law for about 10 or 15 years, maybe, before I went back and started doing creative things. One of the interesting things I do now is I teach a class at the University of Miami in the Wolfson School of Communications. I teach how to make a art documentary, how to make a documentary about art and artists. And I have asked, and they have generously agreed, that half the class be lawyers, people that are in law school at the University of Miami, my alma mater. And so half the class is law students. They come to the class, they think, well, we're law students. It's just a matter of execution, X, Y, Z. And then I get these great undergrads who are really very passionate and very creative, and we mush them together. And uh, and it's a great thing to watch because the, the, the law students kind of flex a little bit and get their creativity back. And uh, it's a really nice thing to be able I, to do. I can't believe I'm hearing you say this. Now. When I, my, the first half of my practice, I was on my own and I had, I mean, I was doing like not just traditional kind of cases. I was scrambling to get cases. So I'd always get like the craziest story. It was always just right. some over the top story. And I had a friend and I said, listen, I think I've got 17 episodes here of something. And this is before the Netflix craze went, but you know, and I wrote them up and my friend was producing for the Playboy channel out in California. And I said, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. Should I try? I think the stories there, they sound good. And he shot it down. He said, there's no chance you could, you know, write up the best script, but there's one out of 2000, get a pilot. And then even if you get a pilot, you're not going anywhere. So he shot me down. Well, you know, 10 years later, I have one of my, one of my other best friends who I had been talking to about calls me up and he's like, you're never going to believe your show is on. Um, I don't know. It wasn't Netflix, but better call Saul. He was like, you're, you're better call Saul. And I said, no, yeah. those, that was really, no. that was really out left field. Yeah. Well, it's frustrating. It's yeah. frustrating because, because you, you know, yeah, you, you can become very disillusioned by it all because it is such a such a difficult thing to get something made. But I've always taken the premise that I make for myself and I make for the audience that you know I I want to see the films and I'll find a way to get them seen. I, I don't worry about you know being with a studio or taking notes from a from a vice president of production or things like that. I just go out and make films. I don't, I don't mess around Yeah, you know, I just go out and do it and I find a channel for them. For me, a lot of it has been on public television because what I make is very uh, responsive to public television because it's about art and artists. And, you know, you can't find a lot of art and artist stuff on uh, network TV, even on the streamers, unless it's a big film. Uh, so for me, I just, I make first and worry about who sees it later. I, I want the joy of making, you know, that's really what it is. So I've heard you talk, um, you know, a little bit about storytelling and and how important that is, and a lot of the things that you do. But when you did, when I heard you you talking about this, this was before your late your third act. You're now in your third act, right? Is this going to be the final act? Or you, God, I hope so. I know. Wait, we don't. We don't. Know. All right. But yeah, look, I mean, this is it. You know, I, I I will be very happy if I spend the next fifteen or twenty years in my studio working on art about. Uh, pop culture and about historical objects and about branded things and also make a film every now and then. I'm very, I'm working on four films right now. Yeah, so I'm very happy. I want to get to those also. Um, and also where, what you're going to be showing in your art, art shows coming up, but is the storytelling part of your new iterate, your new making art? Are you, are you making art that tells a story? How, do, how does that, how does that come into play? Yeah, it's, it's a good question, and I think I, I I think the answer is that I um I wouldn't have been able to make art without having gone through the filmmaking process because the filmmaking process made me feel like, gee, maybe I could tell a story. Maybe I was able to kind of uh, throw off the shackles of having been a lawyer and a CPA for many years, and I could tell something that was narrative and interesting. Of course, I do use documentary films as my practice. So I'm not making up things from whole cloth like Better Call Saul and like your 17 episodes. But I but I have learned to tell a story. And so 
the, the scariest time for all this, this, all this creative practice was when I started making the films. When I started making the art, that's a world I've lived in for 46 years. I've been in the art world forever. I've bought over 2000 works of art as a collector. I've been on seven museum boards, uh, you know, so it, it's a world I know. And when I started making the art, I didn't show anybody for the first five years. I didn't tell anybody for the first five years because I, I, I couldn't quite find the thread that I wanted to pull on. And so um, after about five years, and I've been at it about nine or 10 now, I finally found something that I thought, this is what I want to show people. This is what I believe people might be interested in. And so I threw away everything I'd made up until that point, threw it all away. And then I started making the work that I'm showing now, which is this work about historical ephemera, historical objects. Um, I just bought, uh, as a part of a work I'm about to show, an Olympic torch from the Munich Olympics in 1972, when the terrorists came and took the Israeli athletes and coaches, and they all perished in a firefight, uh, you know, at the airport. But I have an original Olympic torch, and I have the original programs from there, and and, and I'm making a piece out of that. So it's that kind of practice where I'm finding things that are interesting on their own, and hopefully I can add a little something to it to make it even more interesting. So I, you know, I live with a girl. Uh, my girlfriend is an artist. You know her. She and is. She's a good artist. She, she's an excellent artist. And we are, I mean, you know, I, you know, I'm not involved, but I listen and we bounce off ideas, you know, and all the time. One curator says, oh, your art has to be political. And then the other one, no, it doesn't. It doesn't have to really mean anything. Yes, it does have to mean anything. And then we get into, you know, what is contemporary art? How long is contemporary art going to be in existence? Is there going to be like surrealism kind of died at a certain point? But, you know, where all the isms die at a certain point, all the isms. OK, and so that's my question to you. The contemporary will contemporary art die? I mean, 100 years from now, is the new art then going to be considered contemporary or it will? It yeah. will. What we're doing today uh, won't be contemporary anymore. If we're lucky, it'll be considered modern. And if not, it'll just be considered back then. Yeah. Um, you know, when you're making and you have a practice, you have to trust your instincts and make the work that you uh, are able to make based upon where you are in the world, what you've done. You know, I, I can't make work about uh, the digital age is easy as a 23 or a 25 year old, because I'm on the wrong side of the digital divide. But boy, am I good with an old newspaper or a film clip from the 60s or 70s? That's my metier. And so uh, you have to understand that. And you have to understand that that you have to take the skill set that you've been given and the and the 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 life that you've lived, and then you can make something conceptual out of it. Uh, and that's and that's what I've tried to do. You won't find a lot of whiz bang in my stuff. My stuff is very analog. It's very old school because that's me. You yeah. know, it would be silly for me to try to make work, you know, about about uh, uh, the, you know, the very, very uh, deep digital world that I'm I kind of on the outside looking in. I, I it's not it's nobody's fault. I, I just got bypassed by that. When I was a CPA, we didn't have computers, bro. Yeah. Okay. We didn't have computers. And then when we got the first computer, I'd already stopped. I'd gone to law school by then. They used to have to wheel it in on a hand cart when you'd go to the client. It was like the size of a refrigerator. So, you know, I mean, that's old school. That's, that is old school. Well, let's turn to new school. And I want to hear, you know, I mean, you're telling me you're, you know, traditional, you know, medium kind of guy. NFTs, are you, can you wrap your brain around that? In the Yeah, old I am not a big NFT guy. I have looked at it very carefully. As a collector in particular, I looked at it very carefully. And um, I, I think that I'll give you the corollary. And that is if you look back 10, 15, 20 years, video art has been a, you know, a pretty big thing. Um, but it doesn't sell for any money. You have to look super hard to find an artist who makes video art and sells for a lot of money. There are a few, Paul yeah. Pfeiffer, uh, 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 people like that, Bruce Nauman, but, but there aren't many. And so the public doesn't love something that they think that they can run a copy of and and uh, and watch on their TV. They don't like to pay up for that. NFTs yeah. are like that. Yeah, I know the blockchain is supposed to prevent them from being replicated, but if you can, you know, if you can watch it on your computer, people aren't so excited about owning that stuff. And so I never got into NFTs. I, 
I helped some of our artists at Oolite make NFTs to see if they could get it rolling. We we had an understanding uh, with with the McClatchy uh, organization, you know, the, the the journalism organization, and we made a bunch of NFTs uh, with our artists to see if we could get traction. But we didn't really get any traction. Really? So, is there anybody out there right now that's still has hope in the NFT world? Well, I think what Beeple did, um, you know, in selling his for, I don't know, $62 million or something. The, the thing is, is you hear that and you think, well, if he sold it for 62, I'll take a million and be happy, yeah. but it doesn't work that way. Um, I, you know, I, I I don't see a lot of NFTs uh, by anybody. And the interesting thing about it is the art world rushed toward it very, very quickly, including the auction houses, Sotheby's, Christie's, you know, and then they immediately pulled back uh, within a year. So yeah. that's kind of one of those flash in the pan things that I think you're not going to see a lot of going forward. There will be something digital that will catch on using probably using uh, AI, you know, artificial intelligence. Um, but we haven't seen it yet. We don't know what it is. NFTs were almost like the appetizer, the hors d'oeuvre, getting you ready for what the main course is going to be. And there'll be something that comes out of AI uh, that does that. I'm starting to make a film now with AI and I'm having fun with it, but it's not it's not the same. Yeah. All right. Well, you brought that up then. So tell me about the film with AI. Well, I, I a friend and of mine wrote a poem you... that he read at an event that I was at, and I really loved the poem. And I went to him and I said, I'd like to make a short film about this. And he said, great. And then I sat down and I started to look at the poem and think about the shots that I wanted to go capture with a camera in our city. And then I thought, well, those shots are out there somewhere already. Somebody's already done them and maybe they're open source. Maybe they're you know, of, of, you know, available without having to license them or do things like that. So I started to use AI to pull the shots. Um, but it's quirky and it's weird and it gives you something. And then you look at it and go, that's not really what I was thinking about. It, you know, you're much better off basically just taking your camera, going out, shooting the stuff you want to shoot and editing it together. So there's going to be a huge, huge value in AI for all of us at some point. Um, but you're kind of in the pioneer days right now. It's a bit of the wild, wild west out there. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm struggling to see, uh, you know, listen, you know, from what I read, I, uh, I haven't done it, but you can create images using AI. So you can create anything. <laughs> where, where does that lead? I mean, are you going to be able to, Hey, let me, you know, create the, do create the Mona Lisa for me. Exactly. You know, I mean, can I do that? And, can I have the Mona Lisa, you know, on my, uh, you know, my roof or whatever? And yeah, yeah, I the mean, deep no, fakes, the deep fakes are going to be a problem because you, you know, it's very hard to uh, know the difference digitally about certain things. Which brings me back to what I do is I take historical objects and I turn them into art. But when you look at them, you're not confused about whether they're real or not. I mean, I'm looking, you know, off the screen here at twelve editions of the New York Times from 1861 to 1865. Yeah. You know, th those are real. You're, nobody's going to be confused about that. So are you looking for things in particular or are things kind of coming to you and you're like, wow, I, I'm interested in that? I mean, I heard yeah. one. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I think the hardest thing about the making has been that I'm not a tremendously introspective person. I just get going and I go straight ahead and I just, you know, I just keep plowing through everything. And when you're making work, you can only really make work from your own learned experience. And that's caused me to go back and mind the things that I grew up around, thought about, have experienced. And that's been a very difficult and uh, uh, personal process for me. I ask people all the time, and let's do it on your podcast. I'll ask you, what is the, because I'm working on a big piece now about this, what is the most important, vivid, collective memory that you have experienced. For me, a collective memory is not your dad got your bike. A collective memory is the world, you know, uh, dealt with it at the same time you did or the, or the nation did. So for me, it's Kennedy's assassination. I was eight years old, uh, it was 19, 1963. And uh, that was a big, big moment for me. I've never forgotten that. A huge part of my practice has to do with Kennedy, uh, the White House being Camelot, you know, the assassination, the period of mourning, Oswald. What about you? What is your what is your most vivid collective memory? I, you know, I'm I'm a lawyer. I'm walking into the courthouse library and I find out about the the, the trade centers coming down and sure. I, in disbelief. Sure. I just said that's the number one answer when I ask people. I just you know I I heard it and I said that couldn't happen and walked and opened up my law books and then I'm like, 
hmm, maybe I should turn the TV on and, and see what's going on. Yeah. That, yeah. And I don't know if this would qualify under your uh, definition of collective, but uh, 19, oh, another 1984 story. Um, I'm with my father at Yankee Stadium um, above the, the behind the plate, upper deck. Buddy Bell from the Texas Rangers hits a foul ball. My father, we weren't even on the edge, but my father jumps out to the edge, puts his hand on the ground. There's about four other guys. So there was a collective. And my father's a very humble, love, lovable guy. He got it. Didn't even like make a move or whatever. Just sat down and said that, did this. <laughs> yeah, so, I, don't, I don't consider that a collective memory, but an amazing memory. Yeah. But I am making, I am making a, a series of works all about Joe DiMaggio. Yeah. Because I was able to acquire from Joe DiMaggio's estate a series of films that he had in his estate. One was about his honeymoon with Marilyn Monroe. And then I went out and acquired the Daily Newses from the week she died and made a piece about it with, with real uh, film footage. I bought from his estate the screen test, his original screen test in 1937 of his first wife, Dorothy Arnold. And I made a, a video piece about that. Yeah. So the Yankees and DiMaggio are a big part of my uh, of, of, of my art practice. A quick, I'm going to try to give a quick Joe DiMaggio, because I know some people are, you know, to think positively, negatively. Uh, you know, he was a member of Lagorse Country Club. And one guy that I play golf with was a junior uh, back, you know, when he was, Joe was a, a member. And the rule was you could not ask Joe for a signature, okay? And there was a couple of other famous people that were at the club then or whatever. So my buddy, he was he was giving birth. His wife was giving birth the next day and her mother flew into town and it was all these ladies. And he's like, oh my God, there's too much estrogen. I got to get out of the house. They were like, get out of the house. You know, go play golf. So he goes to play golf and Joe DiMaggio is sitting next to him and he's and Joe was like, hey, how's it going? He like, you know, brought up the conversation and he's told him what's what's happening tomorrow. I'm going to be a father with my first time. Joe's like, very nice. Congratulations, whatever. A week later, my buddy comes back to play golf, opens up his locker and there is a baseball signed by Joe DiMaggio. Like, good luck with the baby or whatever. Anyway. So, I mean, I thought. Well, so what's amazing about that is I got onto this Joe DiMaggio kick because every morning, uh, I, it's probably in the 80s also. Yeah, because I was, a, I became a lawyer in 81, probably around 84. Again, I would go to a place that I think it was called Arnie and Richie's then. It's now Roasters and Toasters on 41st Street. And I would walk in every morning to have my breakfast, and Joe DiMaggio was sitting there. And as you said, couldn't talk to him, couldn't look at him, couldn't ask him for anything. Yeah. And he looked like the unhappiest man in the world. Yeah. And when I started to make art, I began to think about him. And I began to think about why is he such an unhappy guy? I mean, he's the greatest ball player of his era, you know, a generational player. Um, and I didn't know. And then I just began to do research. And I wound up with these pieces of art about Joe DiMaggio. So, yeah, it's a Joe's a Miami guy, too. Yeah, no, it's crazy. All right. So, I mean, that segues flow. I know you're a big flow guy and you like to ref, uh, to bring in the baseball reference. Let's go through with that. Some of our listeners out there, maybe they're like me. Maybe they're in their 50s and they're like, "What is there another chapter in my life? I've always wanted to do photography. I, you know, how can I call myself an artist? I didn't even go to art school. All right. So there's a great book uh, that I've used almost like a Bible by Mihaly Chizmihaly, who just passed away uh, last year. And it's called flow. And flow is that moment in your life, to use another baseball metaphor, where you're up to bat for something and the pitcher throws the ball. And as it comes across the plate, you're in a, such a state of deep meditation flow that it looks like a beach ball. In other words, you couldn't miss it if you tried. And of course, there are other times in your life when they throws the ball and it comes across as a BB and you couldn't hit it if you tried. The thing with flow it's that deep state where you're working on something that you enjoy so much and you look up and three hours have passed and you don't know how, you know, it's just, you're just in such a state of deep joy and satisfaction and everything. The problem with flow is you can't order it like a pizza. Yeah. You got to know when it comes. I always carry a notebook everywhere now in case I have a great flow idea or I get into that moment. You got to know when it comes and you got to embrace it when it comes. And that's where your creativity comes from. Um, you know, you have to do the things that bring you joy, I think. And, and that's been a big component of my life. I've changed 
my careers, if you will, a lot because I was always searching for things that would bring me joy. And for me, the joy dissipates after about five years of doing something. So I've never, other than the art world, which has brought me great joy for almost 50 years, all the other things I've done, the entrepreneurial things I've done, the venture capital things I've done, I liked practicing, frankly. I liked being a CPA. Um, but they all dissipated for me after a while. I had to go search for something else. And so, yeah, if you're late in your life and you're like me, you're starting something as a third act, you know, you got to look for the joy in it and see, you know, what makes you happy? Does does making ceramics make you happy? Um, does writing make you happy? You know, there's a lot of great uh, memoir classes now that you can take. I think we all have a story, a memoir in us. Um, you know, you were talking about your 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 family. You know, everybody's Bobby and Zadie grew up on uh, on South Beach. You know, that's yeah. how we got to the last resort because everybody kept telling us these stories. And of course, I I told that story through the eyes of two photographers. So a, as an art film, yeah. Right. So it's there. You just got to go search for it. And the last thing is you've got to widen your aperture. You know, we all live these lives that are kind of this narrow and you've got to slow down and widen your aperture and let things in that maybe before you would have never let in. And yeah. that's a hard thing to do. We're not used to that. It's uncomfortable sometimes. Taking a chance, be willing to accept failure. Um, you know, is, is this a carpe diem kind of concept? I think the willingness to accept failure is more important. You know, you have to try a lot of stuff. I'm not afraid to try stuff. I'm less afraid of failing. If somebody asks me what my biggest regret is, I wish I was braver earlier about trying yeah. things. But in the beginning, I've always feared failure quite a bit. It's just a part of my makeup. Now, as I've gotten older, one of the great things about getting older and trying stuff is you really are less afraid of failing because you've been through the mill, you've had a life, you, yeah. know, you know it ain't the end of the world if it doesn't go well. And so it's a good time to try new things because you're braver. You know, yeah. you, you, you just have more life experience and know that if it doesn't work out, you know, you're still going to have, you know, coffee in the morning and uh, get, you know, go out and walk your dog. So it's all good. All right. So you mentioned the last resort. I want to talk about the Miami films, the film industry. A lot of people now know that Miami is a big place for art, visual art, uh, contemporary art. I don't know that people realize uh, what the film scene is in Miami. Um, but you are part of it, Billy Corbin. I mean, there's been some interesting documentaries, uh, you know, your, the birth of Miami Sound, the story of the 50s with Clifford Still, The Last Resort. Well, I saw The Last Resort and I saw The Birth of Miami Sound. They both were excellent. And The Last Resort kind of was my intro. What, you know, Miami before, you know. Yeah. Team, not, I think my 90, 1984, Miami Vice, Art Center and me leaving are what turned it around. And you get, you get your head together. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. All right, well, but Miami Vice certainly turned it around. I, I can't speak for your departure, though. Yeah, so. my departure didn't really have an effect. Okay, I'll, I'll grant you that. All right, so 16 regional Emmys. I mean, you are like all over the place. Um, you know, Bunny and Jay Fletcher are two of your recent. Talk to me about what the Miami film scene is. Let's say I'm a film guy. I want to, I want to do films. I want to do short films, documentaries, whatever, you know, is this a place for me? Well, it is if you're making indie film. In other words, we don't have a lot of film industry down here. Uh, you know, they don't shoot Spider-Man here. We don't have what's called a film credit like uh, Georgia has had for many, many years. It just expired. And what it is, is you'd come into town as a Hollywood producer and director, you'd bring your crew, you'd shoot, and you'd get a rebate of 10 or 20% of the money you spent in town. We didn't, we had it for a little while. We spent it. The politicians said not good value. Yeah. And the film community at the commercial level, the expensive, you know, 10, 20, 100, 200 million dollar films, they just follow the credit. You know, they go like Atlanta's films have dropped tremendously because the credit has expired and the politicians didn't renew it. But for indie film, which is what I make and what I live for, my budgets are small and, you know, but my films get seen. I mean, that's the great thing about Miami films is you you can follow a path to have them seen. And and so Miami's a great indie film town. We have some of the greatest indie filmmakers, certainly Billy and Alfred, Billy Corbin uh, and, you, you know, and Alfred's film. Those guys are 
the best documentary filmmakers I've ever met. They're incredible. And they, and they tell the really badass, tough, I love Miami, it. I love hardcore it. stories, you know, I I'm, I'm more of a, I don't do gotcha. You know, I'm more of a yeah. happy filmmaker talking about art and artists and I'm happy doing that. Um, those guys are, you know, I mean, they're amazing. They're very special. So I have a great documentary community guy in town named Kareem Tabsh, who I've made, uh, the, the last resort with, he just did a film a couple of years ago about Walter Mercado, the very famous, uh, uh Spanish, uh, horoscope guy, amazing, amazing film played everywhere in the world. Um, so on the doc side, we're great on the narrative side, the fictional side, we were having a hard time getting our filmmakers to move from shorts to features. So when yeah. I was at Ulite Arts, uh, which is, as, as you talked about, it's a local artist support organization where I've just finished being the CEO for the last seven years. I just stopped to follow my own practice. We started a film program uh, in which we would give somebody who had made a great short film 50 grand and say, go make a feature. Yeah. Now, if you're used to Spider-Man, 50 grand doesn't take you very far. But frankly, we made The Last Resort, which did hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars of box office plus streaming for $38,000. Yeah. So it can be done. You have to make a certain kind of film. You know, if you think your film's going to have like huge hurricanes in it that are going to be created by computers, you're probably not, not going to be successful. But for a but for a personal, small, lovely, thoughtful film, that's what Ulite has been doing. They funded eight or nine of them. Uh, the last three films that Ulite has funded have won the prizes at the Miami Film Festival. They've won Berlinale. They just won at Tribeca. So there's a great thoughtful, young mostly, which I love. I love working with young people. So I'm lucky to be able to make films. There's a great community down here for indie film. All right. I love it. Is there any rumors of stuff that's, that Billy Corbin is working on? Anything that- Yeah, is but I, I I don't give Billy up ever. You want to talk about that? Uh, Get Billy to come on here. You'd love oh, having him. Right. Well, He's you'll a have wonderful to make me guy. Alfred too is his partner. I know what the, a couple of things are working on, but if they ain't talking, I ain't talking. You ain't talking. All right. Well, I mean, the the the, the birth of the Miami Sound. Like I'm a music guy. I play guitar, and you know, you're when I say you're inspirational, you're kind of inspirational for me because I've been playing guitar in a band for I don't know thirty years. We tried an open mic one time at uh, the um, uh, the, the Churchill's. 54th Street, classic place. I was so excited. I finally got my dysfunctional band to do it. All right. We went out there and they've got it. They had a patio in the back. And as soon as we started to play, a lightning storm started to stop. And I said, <laughs> I am not good looking. And uh, I'm missing a couple of other things. And this is maybe a sign from that. But maybe you, know, you need to go on the temple circuit. There you go. There you go. I like that. I like that. My temple, Judea, they do have an amazing choir, or whatever. And I know some people in there, but you know, we'll get there. You know, I'll, my people will talk to your people about that whole concept. <laughs> <laughs> All yeah. right. So I um, you know, the way that the uh, Deep City, uh, the birth of the Miami Sound, came to me was very strange. A buddy of mine who I had been making wine with, I've been making wine for the last 20, I guess my 22nd vintage this year yeah. in Australia, mostly a couple other places, but he sent me a, a CD back when we had CDs and I opened it up and I listened to the music and I called him, I said, this is amazing. What is this? He goes, you don't know. I go, no. He says, that's the Miami uh, uh, soul scene in the 1960s. I said, can't be. I know everything about Miami. He goes, take a look. And I, I went back, I read the liner notes and I was like, how could I, you know, Mr. I think I know everything about Miami guy, yeah. not know that we had one of the greatest soul music scenes in Miami uh, of the country, you know, not Motown, not quite, but yeah. just below Motown. And I went back and I started to dig and dig and dig. And I found all of these people who uh, were incredible musicians, Little Beaver, you know, uh, um, uh, Willie Clark, who was one of the Willie great Clark. producers. Uh, Clarence Reed, Betty Wright, who recently passed away, uh, Helene Smith, who we just made a new film with about a year and a half ago, in which we got her back in the recording studio for the first time in 43 years to sing a song. And we, we just made a half hour film about it, played it on PBS, won a prize, all that kind of stuff. So there, uh, Miami just has a plethora of untold stories. And of course, it's also a weird place. So it's a plethora of untold weird stories. But in this case, we simply wanted to pay homage to these incredible musicians who yeah. had not had their moment and deserved it. 
and for any music fan out there, I mean, you know, Motown, the whole nine yards, but these artists were really right there. They just didn't get there. Well, I mean, the, the distribution of their music was in a kind of a cartel that, you know, if you didn't play ball, you didn't get north of Tampa, basically. And yeah. that's what happened. It was all, you know, it, it, it was controlled by other folks and um, they simply never broke out. And, um, but boy, I go back and you listen to the music. Uh, it, it, it's called Deep City. And you can you can listen to it on Numero, N-U-M-E-R-O, Numero Records, which is a Chicago-based organization that basically uh, bin dives and finds old audio tapes and things like that all over the country. Who knew the Columbus, Ohio soul scene was so amazing? I have their stuff from Columbus, uh, Cleveland, you know, amazing, amazing stuff. So Miami's very, very lucky to have had Betty Wright and Helene Smith and Clarence Reed and, uh, 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 you know, Johnny Pearsall. And I mean, all these people, just incredible. All right. So let's talk about the films that you're working on. Are you allowed to talk about that? Um, yeah, sure. Right, let's sure. go ahead. So, so I'm working on a film right now I'm very excited about. Some of your uh, listeners may know that the most famous American sculptor of recent times, Richard Serra, died two weeks ago. He is the guy that makes the big rusty metal kind of walls that curve around. If you've been to the Guggenheim and Bill Bow, you've seen yeah. them. If you've been to uh, New York, you've seen him in MoMA. So I have a friend who owns a Richard Serra uh, sculpture. It's the longest Richard Serra in the world, I believe. It's 216 feet long. And we're getting ready to move it from storage in Jacksonville, Florida, to a place on the West uh, Panhandle that I can't speak about where it's going yet. But I'm making a movie about the moving of the Richard Serra. It is so big that there are only four trucks in America that can handle one of the eight pieces that comprise the sculpture. Oh and, at, and you load it up on the truck, you start driving, you have to have two guys with sticks that pick up the traffic lights so you can slide under them and then put them back down again. Oh my God. Sometimes to go under the overpass, you have to let the air out of the tires to get through. Uh, when you hit a tree, you have a guy with a cherry picker that cuts a notch so that everything can get through. So I'm making this uh, film, about this odyssey of moving yeah. Richard Serra. Yeah. All right. Any other films? I am working on a film right now about a guy from uh, that was born in the Ukraine, came to America in the 1950s, was a railroad guy uh, in Philadelphia, and then came down to Miami Beach one day on a three-day vacation and never left. He said, this is for me. He was close to retirement anyway. His name is George Voronovsky. And George took a room on the third floor of the Colony Hotel, now with the famous blue neon sign, but back then with just the sign. And he was right next to the top O under the sea in the Colony Hotel. And 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 he was uh, uh, just a guy. He came down, retired, eight by 12 room, $85 a month, you know, fit his pension from the railroad. And he wound up starting to make art. Very kind of naive, outsider, self-taught art. And it's beautiful. And my friend Gary uh, Monroe, who was in The Last Resort, he was one of the two photographers in The Last Resort. He met George, kept the work uh, that George was making for him. When George passed, he left it to Gary. And recently, Gary got the work to a very important curator at the High Museum in Atlanta. And she did a show. And George is a, post you know, it's a posthumous show. George has been dead for 40-something years. And he... Um, the show was, he didn't have very many materials to work with. So one of the most beautiful paintings is on the back of a Pizza Hut box. I mean, the, the work's incredible. And now George has become this cause celeb. He's he got yeah. reviewed in the Wall Street Journal. He's been in every magazine. So I'm making a very short film about the journey of George Voronovsky. I don't have a title yet, but that's a pretty good title, actually. I like it. Um, now, do you ever look for actors or actresses, you know, for your films? People that look but like me, sound like me. I don't do narrative films yet. I'd like to do one. Yeah. My, yeah. Mine are all uh, documentaries. I've made 87 films. Every one has been a documentary. So if you have a great story to tell or you're part yeah. of a story I'm telling, yeah, I absolutely am looking for somebody that looks like you. But basically, uh, that's all I do is I only do documentaries. And I only do documentaries about art and artists. Um, yeah. I kind of feel like, given that I didn't go to film school and I don't really know what I'm doing most of the time, um, it's better to at least have the subject matter be something I know something about. Yeah. Now, in my show notes for the show, can I quote you on the I don't know what I'm doing most of the time? It's uh, true. I'll leave it's that true. out. 
All right. Any other films that you're working on? Um, right ah, those are good. I, I've got okay. a couple I'm working on, but I ain't talking yet. Okay. So you said you're going to be doing some art shows with your new stuff. Yeah. And Uruguay, you mentioned? Yeah. I'm going to do a show in, in Uruguay in uh, February. I'm going to okay. do it in a place, a very interesting place. I'd never been to Uruguay before, and I went a couple of months ago. It is dazzling. If you haven't been, go immediately. It's beautiful. The people are lovely. Um, but I'm going to do a show in a place in Uruguay that is known as the Marfa of South America. Marfa, Texas is a kind of land that time forgot place in central Texas that's hard to get to, but it's become this kind of artistic uh, community. And in Latin America and South America, uh, Garzon, Uruguay, is a place like that where there's six art galleries and hardly anything else and a Francis Malman restaurant, which is very important to me. Yeah. Uh, they have great food and great wine and great beef and all that. So I'm going to do a show there and I'm working on the pieces now. And um, it's going to be a conceptual show in which I work with um, a series of uh, unusual objects. Uh, and um, I'm having fun with it so far because I'm a wine guy. I've yeah. actually decided to make a piece about uh, the Tanat, T-A-N-N-A-T, the Tanat grape, which is a great, which is a varietal that the French have tried to work with and haven't had very much success. But for some reason, the Uruguayans have taken this Tanat vine and they make really great wine with it. And if you taste it anywhere else in the world, it's not as good. So I'm working on that and, I, you know, make, we're making a piece about explaining that. All right. So if I wanted to actually see your artwork right now, is it showing anywhere locally or? By well, um, at any point in time, you know, there's work somewhere. I just had a show in London, um, but the best place to see it is at Shoal Creative. That's my first name, S-C-H-O-L-L, -L, uh, all one word, creative.com. And my Instagram is pretty uh, fun. It's uh, at Shoal Creative. Uh, yeah. In both of those places, you can see the art, you can see some of the films. Um, you know, that's kind of my creative hub where I stuff everything as it gets done. Gotcha. I hear. Well, that's that's the modern world for you. All right. So, um, all right. Last topic. I want to, you know, end with I, I right before we did our podcast, I listened to another podcast that you were a guest on that uh, Stuart Sheldon, who I grew up with, um, he was it was his podcast and it was an excellent show. So I didn't want to go over a lot of the same things that they talked about. I tried to keep, you know, some of the top, you know, so you know, if anybody wants more of Dennis and his story and how he first, you know, got into the art movement and that, had, you know, was a fisherman, you know, from New Jersey and all that kind of stuff. And a lot of other, the, of, of the later stuff with um, Ulight and the art center and all that. But I do want to talk about uh, the Ellie's. Um, I know that Stuart won an Ellie. Uh, and what are the Ellie's and where is that in the spectrum of the art world at this point? Has that, is it is it trending upwards? Has it had successes? Is it, you know, where are we going with it? Sure. And, and so, where did it start from? So the first thing I did when I got to Ulight Arts seven years ago, uh, now maybe eight years ago, I've been gone uh, almost I guess nine months now. I, I I retired from it about nine months ago. Um, the first thing I did was to say, you know, we've been gifted with this largesse. We sold a building. The the Ulite organization sold a building on Lincoln Road um, about fifteen or eighteen years ago for eighty eight million dollars. Took that money, invested it, and then called me up and said, "Would you come and and help us? You know, put this put this do something with." with uh with Ulight uh and I said God it sounds great you know most organizations nonprofits have to raise like crazy uh we raise but it wasn't you know it wasn't the thing that would hold us back was money and so the first thing I did when I got there is I said we've got to get some of this money on the street to the local artists in the community so we created this contest called the Ellie's named after at the founder of Ulight Ellie Schneiderman Ellie was a potter who um uh, wanted to bring a lot of artists together. So she uh, wound up with a bunch of buildings on Lincoln Road when you could buy them for $20 a foot. I turned down buildings on Lincoln Road <laughs> for $20 a foot. Oh, wow. I also had a career as a developer of historic buildings on South Beach. I bought yeah. and renovated 20 historic Art Deco apartment buildings and put them on the National Register of Historic Places. 
Um, but I turned down a lot on Lincoln Road and boy, was that a mistake. Yeah. Um, so, but Ellie brought a bunch of artists to Lincoln Road and and uh, so we wanted to name this thing after her. And what it is, is we go out to the community and we say, what are you working on? What could you use help with as an artist? Send us a very short 150 word application. And if the jury likes it, independent jury of curators and art professionals and things like that, if the jury likes it, we're going to give you money up to $25,000. And so I, I think it's probably in its eighth year now. And we've had around 250 winners in the community in Miami-Dade. It's a Miami-Dade contest. And the projects have been amazing. And we've given people the money to realize their artistic dreams, basically. You know, that's that's what's happened. And so Oolite has been doing that Um I started it when I got there. They're still doing it long after me. They uh, uh, Last October was probably the seventh one. And the projects run the gamut. One artist, a Miami artist, uh, got the chance to make a maze on a museum's uh, front lawn uh, uh, up in Buffalo, New York. But she's a Miami artist. She lives here. And so we want to, we're here to support the community's vision, its dreams. And that's what the Ellie's have done. Um, and everybody has been really excited about it. It's it was my favorite day of the year when I when I was the CEO of Ulight Arts. I, I love doing it. Um, I had a similar job uh, when I was at Knight Foundation all over the country. In seven years, I gave away uh, two hundred million dollars of Knight Foundation's money to arts organizations all across the country. It was a good gig, just like uh, being CEO of Ulight. It was a great gig. Um, it's my passion to do arts philanthropy anyway, and to do it with somebody else's money makes it really fun. There you go. All right. Well, that'll do it for this episode. I do want to give a shout out to my girlfriend, Stephanie Jaffe Werner, who's an amazing artist also for introducing me to you. It is. Because uh, you can see that I'm a very shy person and I never would have done this, uh, but for her. Um, Dennis, I hope you enjoyed this episode. It was and a blast. Uh, and we didn't talk about mass tort law, which I was really not capable of talking about anyway. So good for that. You know, next episode. Okay, we'll get to <laughs> speed, right? All right, folks. Listen, you know, subscribe, rate, review. Go check out his stuff. I'm going to put a lot of links. His films are amazing. I have not seen your artwork. I will take a look. I just started to follow your Instagram page. Got to get caught up a little bit, but I'm going to do it. I'll be there, all right? Dennis, so you go have a good day and do your thing, all right? Thanks, everybody. Take care, man. That's all for this episode of Cut to the Chase. But before you go, will you open up your podcast app and give us a five-star review? You can also leave a comment about what you liked most or other topics you'd like us to cover. And please be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any upcoming shows. Thanks, everybody. Be safe out there.